Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. Good morning. This is Lori Smith on Blog Talk Radio. It is 6 o'clock here in the morning, Calgary, Alberta, Friday, October the 22nd. I'm happy to be here. This is one child abuse survivor to another, and we're on for 30 minutes. It's a live internet streaming radio broadcast from blogtalkradio.com, and uh chat room is open. I just barely got in here. I had to reboot, and it took me a while to get back in, but everything seems to be up and running, so it's all right. Um, this morning, I want to talk, continue talking about um, the... Uh, Information from Anger Resources, www.angeresources, angerresources.com. And uh, this one article in particular is very interesting. Uh, it's called Communication and Disre- Dispe- Disrespectful Anger, a Poor Match at Best, and written by Dave Decker. And um, Dave Decker and Michael Obsatz are the creators of this website and um, really have some great information on here. I hope everybody will go check it out. It's really worth looking at, uh, talking about road rage and, you know, is our anger a problem and oh, so much good stuff here. This is just really, really good stuff, especially in today's world. Right? In every, it does, it's been going on since time began, you know. Um, I think that, you know, it's just recently that people have, you know, within maybe the last hundred years that people have started to take a look at anger management. And it's important if you want to have a good life, um, if you want to have an an idea of how to um, get your point across without having to get explosive or abusive or disrespectful, right? That's the whole issue. Um, Many of us don't know how to do that, you know what I mean? We don't have the skills, we don't have the the knowledge, and, and I mean, it's just evident with what's going on uh, in our own cities, in our own towns, uh, around the world, really. Um, people just uh, not knowing how to handle themselves in a situation where conf- conflict or or some sort of uh, uh, something comes up that just seems like, you know, the person has to make their point, and yet they don't know how to go about doing it, so they end up hurting people's feelings or hurt or being abusive, right? So that's the thing. And we can all learn how to you know, manage our anger and behave ourselves, right? Because anger is natural. It's a natural response. And, uh, you can check that out here on, on this website and uh, see where Dave Decker was talking about that. And we haven't got into Michael Opseth's articles yet, but um, it's such a huge website. There's so much information on there. I don't know if we'll cover it all. But I really wanted to just kind of take a look at it because anger is something I've experienced my whole life. And I know almost everybody, I, I don't think there'd be one person on the planet that could say that they've, never gotten angry about something. Um, maybe there'll be people that have handled it better. I know for myself, I really have to learn how to handle, um, how to manage my anger because I tend to stuff it and then explode on people. So that's the whole issue. I'm trying to learn how to not do that. So I'm, you know, that's what we're doing. So thanks everybody for tuning in. I appreciate it. Um, uh, I'll get right into this here in a minute. I just wanted to, you know, I always say this on every show, right, because it's so important. I'm not a counselor or, or a therapist. I don't hold any certificates in those areas uh, or degrees. You know, I'm just a private citizen doing my own shows, right, um, because I just wanted to be one more voice out here talking about this stuff as a survivor myself. You know, I just thought, man, I used to think, I didn't think I was the only one. I knew so many people who were abused as children, <clears throat> but I used to think that I was so so lonely, you know, I was just like, you know, I never thought of reaching out or, um, you know, trying to get involved in some sort of, like, group support or trying to, you know, to think about getting counseling or or therapy or anything like that until recently, right? So it's only been the last, like, three and a half years. So, you know, it's such a sad place to be when you're thinking, well, there's no hope for me, there's no help for me. And I've been there, been on the other side of that, and um, so that's why I just want to, I just wanted to be one more voice for people, just to say, you know what? If you hang in there long enough, and you really want to, to um, have a good life, you know, you have to make the first step most of the time, and that is to reach out, because I had, uh, and until I reached out, nobody was reaching in to say, hey, can we help you? Because I didn't wear a sign around my neck saying, you know, hey, I was abused as a child, don't mess with me, or, you know. <laughs> I didn't have a sign around my neck saying, you know, be careful what you say around me. I was abused. Um, so quite often I would take things very personally. If somebody say something, they don't know that I've been abused as a child. And, um, you know, even if they do, you know, why should they have to walk around on tiptoes, really? The whole issue is being that I need to learn how to manage all of my emotions and feelings because of the way I grew up, right? And I'm really working on that. And it's been very helpful. But until I started reaching out, 
um, there was no, uh, there was really no, no difference in the situation. I had spent my whole life, the first 40 years of my life, in this mess, you know, in this situation where um, I just felt that uh, it was hopeless, you know, and that's why I wanted to be one more voice just to say, you know what, it's not hopeless. There is help out there. There's good help out there. And no matter which way you go, whether it's counseling, therapy, group support, you know, um, online group support, whatever it is, just make sure that you reach out and get some help, right? So I'm not a you know, professional. You have to listen at your own discretion. And not only that, but the topics of abuse are very sensitive. So you have to know what's good for you to listen to. And if the show topic bothers you, then you have to turn it off, right? Any show, like, you know, you have to you have to listen to things at your own discretion. And young people under the age of 18, I just ask that you have permission to listen to my show because I really care about kids, and that's the whole issue. I'm the Canada Regional Director for Dreamcatchers for Abused Children, and we're fighting every day, you know, volunteering. All of us volunteer, um, you know, working around the clock, really. We have to sleep a little bit here and there and, and have to work, some of us, but uh, we're working to, to save children's lives. So we want to stop child abuse and we want to protect children. And you have to really be careful and protect yourself when you're online. And you have to know how to do that. So keep yourself safe at all times. And young people, I would ask that you would have someone listen to the show with you. Make sure that it's something that you should be listening to uh, for age appropriateness. And then, you know, uh, you'll be able to hopefully have someone to talk to if if you're just not sure what I'm talking about or the information's confusing because a lot of people have not heard a whole lot about, you know, survivor issues and I talk a lot about my own personal stuff on here. So you want to be, you know, with an adult, someone who's older, uh, to listen to my show to make sure it's something that you should be listening to, right? So we'll get right into this article here. Communication and disrespectful anger, a poor match at best. We were looking at that um yesterday. And Dave Decker says angry and hostile people are poor communicators. He says the most common type of poor communication comes in the form of becoming explosive and lashing out at others. And we talked about that. He's written a whole bunch of great stuff here. He says angry people may also be hurtful in what they say to others by responding in sarcastic and indirect ways. Or they may clam up and say nothing at all. Uh, and that's where we we sort of left off there. Um, also, talking about the three styles of communication... And um, we were looking at standing up for yourself effectively, respectfully, with partners, friends, coworkers, parents, and others uh, can be very difficult. So we were talking about that. And um, then we left off at this section where it says, the best way to begin to become more assertive is to clearly understand the differences between these four styles of communicating. So he says, let's define these styles and give some examples of each. So he says, the most recognized style of communication for angry people is called being aggressive. Uh, the bottom line message when you see use this style is, I count and you don't. <laughs> and this is really, that's sad, right? Being aggressive is certainly standing up for yourself, but it involves being hurtful, punishing, and disrespectful to others, and speaking up at the expense of everyone around you. You get what you want and attain your goals, but there is no consideration for others' rights, feelings, and wishes. And no one else really matters to you. Now, this is what he's written here. It says, on a short-term basis, this approach may seem to work pretty well. You really might be able to get what you want at the time, but eventually others end up feeling hurt, resentful, and threatened and tend to withdraw from you. This only increases the anger and hostility that you feel toward the rest of the world. And the goal of being aggressive is to control and dominate others and to try to appear completely invulnerable. And uh, it's quite interesting to look at aggressive behavior, right? It says, aggressive behavior can be emotional, verbal, physical, and sexual. It can include commands like, we will do this my way. It could be put down like, what an idiot. Why can't you ever do anything right? This is what he's listed here. It might involve threats like, if you keep saying that, you're going to get it. Or it might include nonverbal behavior like raising your voice to drown the other person out of the conversation. Uh, and a cold, steely glare to intimidate someone and get them to back off. So that's the aggressive type, you know. And, and, I mean, I totally grew up around this stuff. My parents were, were both aggressive um, and violent, right? So, I mean, it's no wonder I kind of picked that up from them. Um, and, I mean, I talk about this a lot on my shows. Like, if you go back and listen to the archives and, um, you know, the whole issue of the fact that my parents taught me how to behave. They really did because all parents and caregivers teach their children how to behave because children are little sponges and they're basically uh, picking up the behaviors of whoever's around them uh, at any given time because that's how they learn. And so from the time, you know, a, a child is born, even in the womb, 
can start learning and developing and then they grow up in these situations. So if the parents are handling themselves properly and there's a lot of love and peace and, and uh, goodness and kindness around, you know, compassion, and uh, kids will take that on, you know, and they might eventually when they get teens, you know, have a little bit of trouble with, um, you know, some attitude situations, right, because teenagers are trying to find out you know just how far they can push things right but when but when you grow up like that from zero to whatever um you're going to tend to pick up what's going on around you as a child right so that's what I did and I became aggressive myself uh which then I was punished for because of my behavior see so my parents taught me how to behave and then uh, abused me for it and we're not talking discipline here we're talking abuse and so the thing is is um it's really quite sad you know it's like uh, it would be like your parents, uh, somebody's parents buying some, their kids uh, a pair of pants, and then because the child wears the pair of pants, they abuse them. It's like they, your parents give you something and then abuse you for it. Well, that's what how I feel what happened to, in, in, to me because, you know, my parents taught me how to behave aggressively and violently. And then when I did do what they were doing, I was, I was uh, quite often beaten for it, uh, verbally abused, and um, made to feel like the black sheep of the family actually all the way through my life until, uh, well, actually it's still going on. That's the role that my family has given to me is that I'm just a jerk and I'm... Uh, I'm the black sheep of the family, like my brothers, right? So, and they literally have said stuff like that to me. They would probably, my siblings would probably deny that they would, that especially one of my siblings would deny that they ever said that. But actually, they they did say it, and it did. At the time, it didn't really hurt my feelings because I love my brothers. But I, but I realized what was behind it because I knew how they felt about my brothers. <laughs> so they were really putting me down is what they were doing, and they still do even today. And I'm just like, well, you know what, too bad. My parents taught me how to behave this way. I'm working on how to change it. I'm not playing that role, you know, that, that life script, like Dave Decker talks about here on this website. He talks about life scripts. You know, people are handed these life scripts by their parents and their, their families, their siblings and other people around them, and they're expe- they're expected to play it out. And it's like I'm not playing that life script out anymore, you know. Uh, if they never see me as anything but a, a jerk and, a, and a, uh, the black sheep of the family, well, that's their own problem because I'm moving on. I'm going to learn how to deal with my own stuff and uh, how to be a, a better functioning adult here on the planet and how to uh, help myself and help other people. And, you know, hey, they can see me as whatever how, whatever way they want to, right? I can't change their minds, but I can certainly change mine. And so it's really important if you grew up abused, you know, to know that, um, we can't live our lives according to how somebody else sees us or feels or thinks about us. You know, my dysfunctional family will probably never change their minds about the way they feel about me because they're so uh, bent on seeing things one way. They're not looking at the fact that I'm really trying really hard to um, heal from what I found uh, was going to kill me if I didn't actually start working on it, um, which was the abuse that I suffered as a child. Because they're still in denial, right? They're, very, they're still very much in denial. And so, you know, they're not looking at that. <clears throat> they're not looking at the fact that I'm working on this and it is taking time and they don't want to work on it with me. So basically, there's the rift. There's the, um, you know, basically it's like they're on one side of the canyon and I'm on the other, you know, and uh, there's no bridge across uh, because, you know, they just want to continue on living the way they they always have and I want to change the way that I that I perceive things and feel about things right so it is hard it is very very hard but we can learn how to change our own behavior so that we are not aggressive and hurting other people just to get our way and i think that um you know when you grow up around people that have done that and then you take that on yourself it's a hard thing to change because you almost don't recognize it unless somebody points it out and i mean i it you know sometimes it hurts to have people point out stuff to you but it's so true you know like uh, my niece pointed out some stuff to me the other day that Part of it, I believe she was right, and part of it, I don't. So, But, I mean, I have to look at the whole thing and be as honest as possible. And part of it, I have to say, okay, she was right. And then part of it, I'm like, well, you know what? Part of it, you're wrong, honey, because you weren't there and you didn't see it. So that's the whole thing. It's it's tricky when people have to, people tell you, hey, look at your behavior. But then I always have to ask them to look at theirs, too, and hope that they would. And if they don't look at their own behavior, I can't do anything about that. But what I can do is be concerned with my own behavior. And that's where I've kind of been working on this last, you know, this last six months or so, really, especially. It says, uh, a second communication style that also involves aggressive elements is called being passive-aggressive. And often, I was talking about that yesterday with my sister because she's very passive-aggressive. 
Um, and I kind of probably am too. It says often people are confused about this style and think that it means being passive for a while and then becoming aggressive. In reality, it is much more complicated than that. Again, the basic message is I count, you don't. Once again, it is also standing up for yourself and communicating what you think and feel or want, but different from the aggressive styles, direct and in-your-face approach. Say, I'm aggressive, I'm in your face, right? Um, quote, unquote, right? I'm in, I'm out there, you know, hey, I'm, you know, this is what I feel. Uh, being passive-aggressive involves communicating in an underhanded and manipulative way so that the other person generally has great difficulty knowing exactly what you intend to convey. And that's my sister. and She would never admit it, but if she went to a psychologist, they would tell her. <laughs> because I know what the sign, I know what passive-aggressive means. And I've been passive-aggressive before. It's not like I've never done it. Um, it's another, if I can't get my way being aggressive, then I try the passive-aggressive stuff. See, um, people will try to manipulate the situation in every every instance when they really are trying to get something done, trying to to push for things to happen. Uh, it's not a very good way to do it. There's better ways to communicate. There's better ways to handle things. But my sister, she's very passive-aggressive. She's very, you know, she says things and, and comes across as being this really nice person, but underhandedly, what's going on under underneath of it, if a psychiatrist or a psychologist was in the room, somebody who studies this stuff, <clears throat> they would be able to spot it. They'd be like, okay. <laughs> you know, that's, especially if they knew the situation and they knew about our past and they were they were watching the, our, the way that we communicate together. We both are kind of like that. Um, I'm more in your face type, right? Let's just get it out on the table and and I'll just be aggressive about it and push until I get my way. But she's very underhanded, so she always comes across as looking like the nice person who, um, you know, the the nice one. She's the better one because she's she's always appears to be uh, quite uh, in control and friendly. But until you see what's going on underneath of it, and then you realize that she's pushing to get her way too but just being passive-aggressive about it. See, So that's the thing. We're both doing it. We're just doing it different ways. So, you know, it says this style also makes it hard to hold you accountable for whatever you're saying or doing, right? Uh, because passive-aggressive people, they don't come, they don't appear to be like the aggressive types, like, hey, I'm putting my foot down. I want my way. You know, it's pretty easy to spot somebody who's doing that, but somebody who's being passive-aggressive, who's pushing to get their way, but doing it in a way that most people wouldn't be able to notice, they look like they're just perfect. Hey, that's a great, you know, look at look at the way they handle things, you know, and it's like, well, <laughs> you know, so I mean, being passive-aggressive is not a, it's not a good thing either, right? So the, inten the intention in being passive-aggressive is often to punish or get back at others when they have said or done something you did not like, but it is, uh, done in, in uh, a way that avoids taking any responsibility for yourself and what you are communicating. And that's the thing. See, I take responsibility for what I do. And if I get called out on something and, and people say, look, you know, you're being rude and, you know, I don't like the way that you're be behaving around me, I, I generally have to apologize and say, you know what, that's true. Um, I'm sorry. You know, <laughs> I'll try to do a better job. I really will. And that's the thing. I'm always open to... Um, you know, to acknowledge that people, what people say to me, whereas my sister's not. If you say anything about her behavior at all, she's like my dad, and, and my mom was like that too. If if you question their behavior at all, they they get on the defensive and they won't apologize for anything. No apologies, no nothing, right? As far as their behavior goes, they were just fine. They were just perfect. And you know, you can't you can't work with people like that because they you know, they're not willing to take their part in the whole thing. And that that's the whole issue with these dysfunctional families, you know. It's like sometimes you have one or two people in the family that are willing to say, you know what, um, I was wrong, I'm sorry. And then you have these others that say, yeah, you were wrong and we are perfect, right. And so that's my family for you, you know. It's like, um, hello, people, we all know the whole truth. And so, you know, I just basically humor them because I'm like, right, you're perfect, okay. And so, you know, they don't mind hurting my feelings. But when I hurt their feelings, it's like the end of the bloody world. So that's the thing. They they don't mind walking and stomping all over me and my feelings, right? Um, so that's that whole passive aggressive stuff, right? And then then they don't want to. They don't have to take accountability for it. They don't have to take responsibility for it. And that's until they see it. There isn't much you can do, right? So it says being passive aggressive can include verbal statements. An example um, is becoming sarcastic and saying things like, "I'm sure you really know what you're talking about. I guess you must be Miss Perfect." But frequently, it involves indirect but powerful messages expressed through your behavior. 
you might feel angry about your partner being late or something you enjoy and then um for something you enjoy and then look for an opportunity to be late for something she wants to do another time or he wants to do, right? Or you might forget to do something you agreed to do because you were upset with the other person about a completely separate issue. So it's just kind of holding something against that person and then being passive aggressive about it. Just, oh, well, I just won't do this because, you know, hey, I've I have done this stuff. I mean, I, I will admit, you know, I don't know of anybody on the planet that could say that they've never, ever done anything like this. It's It would be kind of interesting to see if there was one person on the planet that would never do that. I think some people think they never do stuff like that, but then they don't think about their behavior, you know. And I can at any time kind of pull up my behavior at any time where, you know, how I was behaving at a certain time. You know what I mean? So I kind of have the ability to do that. So I sort of remember stuff. I have pretty good memory. And so... You know, most people probably can't remember what they were doing, you know, period, 10 years ago or two days ago. But I kind of remember everything. So it's like, you know, there's bits and pieces at periods of time where I wouldn't remember too much. But I, if I can recall it, I pr- pretty much can remember everything. Um, you know, and that's, I don't know why, but my brain is just like that. I, that's one reason why I do really well at languages, because I can re- I can remember things. So I can remember um, German and Spanish, and, and I could no problem speaking French. You know, that's the thing. Languages for me are, are not a problem because I can keep it stored in the back of my memory banks and then when I need it, I can I can recall it. So I don't know what that is all about. But somewhere in my brain, I guess I just have the ability to remember stuff. And other people just can't remember anything. Conveniently, I think. Um, it's like my, my sister, you know. She doesn't remember, quote, unquote, anything. And I think it's just that she doesn't want to remember anything. So she doesn't care. Right, it doesn't matter to her, so she doesn't remember anything, and then she doesn't have to be concerned with how she was behaving or only how you were behaving. But then she doesn't. And my parents were like that too. You know, they could, they were always um, pushing off the responsibility of their mess on everybody else. Well, it was his fault, or it was her fault, or it was the kid's fault, or it was just the it was the 1960s. That's what my dad likes to say. You know, for his bad behavior. He just blames it on the devil in the 1960s. And it's like, I don't think so, buddy. you got to take responsibility for your behavior, man. It says, being passive-aggressive is especially destructive in relationships because even if others have the audacity to ask direct, directly about what you are trying to communicate, you may simply use this as an opportunity to zing them even further. And the other person might respond to your sar- sarcasm with, you seem really angry, what's going on? At that point, if you want to continue being passive-aggressive, you can simply look confused and respond by saying, hey, what's the matter with you? I was only joking. You sure are sensitive today. Well, that happened to me uh, with a friend of mine, my best friend, actually. Um, she was totally zinging me. We may as well say zinging since they said zinging. Um, we were best friends, and uh, she zinged me in, in front of somebody who you know, didn't know the situation, and I did, and I understood exactly what she was saying, and then said it was a joke when I called her on it. Because I did, I did actually on the spot say, "Hey, I don't like what you just said there. Did I hear you correctly?" And she was like, "I'm just joking. God, you know, you don't have to be so blah blah blah, right?" So that's that whole passive aggressive stuff. Well, it broke us up. It completely broke us up because I was like, "I don't have to take this crap." And you know, if you're not going to be 100% honest with me, I'm not going to even be your friend. So we broke off a friendship that we had uh, for 14 years or 13 years, pretty much. Very sad and uh, unfortunate how people can be, right, very hurtful. And um, even in passive aggressiveness, they can destroy relationships, right? And that's exactly what happened because I wasn't going to tolerate any more of her crap. And I thought, no way, I'm not putting up with this. You know, I've already taken enough garbage from people in my lifetime. So um, I I just told her off and got out of the relationship. So um, I wish her all the best. But the thing is, is, I don't have to be around people like that, you know. And my sister's like that, you know. If if I call her on something, <clears throat> it's okay for her to shove stuff in my face. Look how you're behaving. Look what you're doing. But the minute I say, well, what are you doing? Look at what you're doing. She's like, you know, she she turns it around to make herself look perfect. And it's like, you know what, okay, if you're not going to be honest, well, forget it. You know, there's only, you can't argue with yourself, you know. <clears throat> if you're just going to argue with yourself, there's no point. So if the other people don't want to take responsibility for their behavior, there's not much you can do, right? In every instance, you know, even if you call them on it and you say, look, you know, I don't I don't like that, I don't appreciate that, and then, and they don't want to say, hey, look, I'm sorry. You're right. I was, I was being rude, and uh, I'm sorry, right? It's like if they don't even want to apologize for the way they're treating you, but you're just the bad guy, there isn't much you can do about that, you know what I mean? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> My voice is just terrible today. I didn't talk too much yesterday, so 
or this morning, so it's kind of, it's just not there. It says, um, or the other person might respond to your forgetfulness by expressing a feeling of, or concern about it, at which point you might simply say to them, hey, what's the big deal? I'm only human after all. <laughs> So that's the thing. It says, using this style on a consistent basis is another way to hurt and punish others and eventually leads to emotional distance, a lack of trust and relationship difficulties. Others do not know what you really want to communicate because you are not willing to be honest and straightforward about what you really think, feel, or want. And the third style of communicating is called being passive. Surprisingly, this style is more common in angry individuals than many people realize. All too often, angry people simply withdraw and stuff what they feel in many situations and then explode later, often with those closest to them who are deemed to be safe and reasonable targets for their disrespect, right? So that was me for a long time. I was pretty passive, Um, just stuffing the anger, stuffing it down, right? Then I would explode on people, and I think my sister's kind of like that too. But we we all have traits of this stuff, right? The bottom line message is being... Uh, in being passive is you count and I don't. When you are passive, you violate your own rights because you are not willing to express your thoughts, feelings, and wants honestly and directly to those around you and to actually take care of yourself and your interactions with other people. And this style involves failing to say what you really mean and being fearful about asking for what you really want. Or it may be trying to stand up for yourself but doing it in such an ineffective way that others do not really feel uh, the need to take you seriously. An example of dis counting yourself in this way might be starting to speak up but in but in prefacing it with I probably shouldn't say be saying this but or I hope you don't mind if I tell you this but right being passive is allowing others to treat you in whatever way they want without you being willing to challenge their behavior in a direct and effective way and what is especially disturbing about being consistently passive is that you essentially train other people to take advantage of you so that's exactly what I was doing for a lot of years um, not all my life, but portions of it where I was just thinking, okay, I don't want to hurt anybody, so I'm going to, you know, I would just stuff the anger and then get totally ran over and taken advantage of. So as you actively communicate to them the message that I am unimportant and what I think, feel, and want is insignificant. It says the goal of being passive is to avoid conflict, disagreement, and others' anger and disapproval at any price. And the end result of being passive is submission to everyone around you. Even worse, being consistently passive can bring you both emotional symptoms like depression, anxiety, or frustration, physical symptoms like headaches or stomach upsets. You know, and that was me for a long time. Some examples of passive behavior would include the following. You might say things like, whatever you want is all right, or it doesn't matter to me. You may nod and smile even when you don't agree with with what someone is saying to you. You might agree to do something even if it is significant, uh, if it's a significant inconvenience for you. Or you may communicate to others, both verbally and non-verbally, that you are weak, timid, inferior, and that what you think, feel, or, or want does not really matter. For angry people, being passive has the potential to build an enormous reservoir of resentment and frustration within you, which sets the stage for becoming explosive and aggressive at a later time. And that was me, and probably still is, <clears throat> excuse me, a little bit, right? And that's what I'm working on is not stuff in the anger, dealing with stuff on the spot, you know, and not allowing myself to be taken advantage of just because I don't want to hurt somebody. Because generally, you know, we we might have to kind of hurt somebody's feelings a little bit to make a point. But we can do it without being uh, abusive, you know. If the person's feelings get hurt because they're doing something to you that's hurting you and then you call them on it, well, that's kind of their own problem because they shouldn't be uh, doing so that whatever they're doing to you, <clears throat> excuse me, or to me, right? So that's the whole issue, right? Sometimes we have to stand up for ourselves and do it, you know, in a way that's not that's assertive but not abusive, right? And if we we have to stand up for ourselves, absolutely we do, and we cannot let people take advantage and push us around, and especially as survivors of child abuse, you know, the whole issue of you know being taken advantage of and pushed around. It's like if you spent your whole life like that, it's quite hard to learn how to be assertive without being, you know, too aggressive or uh, or too passive and letting people dump all over you and just run all over you. And that's that's not a good way to live because um, we're cheating ourselves then of a really decent life because then we'll always be in the same boat, right? And that's why, you know, I'm really working on all this stuff. And it's taking time. Let me tell you, it takes time. Um, but it's so worth it because at the end of the road, you know, you change the way that you feel and think about things and you you can move your life in a more positive direction, right, in, in a in a healthier direction. And that's really what I'm trying to do, you know, as far as my, my mental health and my, you know, my whole 
well-being, right? Um, it, it's just so important, right? So we have to learn how to work through this stuff. Well, we'll finish this article off and then take some more, take a look at some of the other stuff. It's really quite a lengthy article. There's quite a bit there too. If you want to finish it off, www.angerresources.com. That's where I was looking at this information from. And hope everybody has a great day. Make sure you just keep reaching out, everybody. You know, don't don't give up. Never, ever, ever give up. It is so worth it. It is so worth it to hang on. I'm on the other side of this now. And I tell you what, I'm so thankful that I did make the decision to stick it out and to fight for my life. Thank God. And, you know, I hope that you will do the same thing, too. And so have a great day, everybody. Have a wonderful weekend. You can check my show page tonight, Dreamcatchers Talk Radio, www.blogtalkradio.com forward slash Dreamcatchers. I'm going to interview Donna Shear. She's the president of Dreamcatchers for Abused Children. She is an author. She's a best-selling author. She's an established writer and a, a journalist. She's a mother. She's a wife. She's uh, She works hard, man, let me tell you, to make this world a better place. I hope that you will tune into this interview, 10 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time, um, here on Blog Talk Radio. Have a great day, everybody. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.